All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Behnaz Rohani. I'm the Ignatic Professional Development Coordinator, and I would like to welcome you to this uh, faculty meetup. We are so glad that you are here, and thank you, Arafina, for uh, agreeing to host this, to facilitate this uh, faculty meetup. This is such an important topic, and hopefully uh, we can develop this uh, small group and move on and have a working group out of this and, you know, get some real work going with each other's uh, collaboration from different corners of the country. Thank you. All right, the floor is yours, Aratana. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm very happy and excited to talk to you all about what I did. No, I didn't do much, but I'm learning. So yeah, it's very nice. So first uh, thing I'll tell a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Aratna Kumari. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, City University of New York. So I graduated in 2017 and then right away I joined as an assistant professor. So my training is in mathematics and I am, uh, you know, kind of recently got uh, very interested in uh, math education. Uh, so um, I will tell a little more about how I got interested and what I did and things like that. But first I wanna know a little bit about um, the audience. So Behnaz already introduced. So let me ask um, Krish. Maybe you can say, uh, you know, where are you and what's your research interest or if you have done any or if you don't and what do you want to do or something like that? Um, well, I'm Trish and I teach at a community college in Southwest Missouri. Um, I have, I actually was hired as a developmental ed, uh, math ed instructor um, 10 years ago. Well, since then, um, so much has changed that we just almost don't have any developmental ed anymore. Um, we have all co-requisites and, and things like that. And so that's where my interests are, is kind of in this changing environment where you kind of have the intersection of state policy and then it collides with, you know, the politics at my school and all that kind of stuff. And are we doing right by the students would be my big question. Um, and how do we do it better? Because we we do have to do it in some form. So, <laughs> got it, got it. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay. Trish, did I yeah. say your name correct? I'm a yes. Retired electrical engineer and uh, transformed into mathematics. I'm 78 years old. I live in Chicago. And uh, guess what? I don't like math, but I love math. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to see what is the discussion today. Thank got you. Got it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, Christine? Hi, so I um, teach at a community college in Eastern Washington State, and I've um, been teaching for 30 years and just started a couple years ago working on my PhD in math education, just for fun. And I am interested in math anxiety and studying sort of ways we can help alleviate the effects of math anxiety. I teach a lot of developmental students at the community college, and um, most of them are quite anxious and also capable of doing math, but the anxiety holds them back to the point where they're vomiting on tests and not able to come to the classroom. They're sitting in their cars in the parking lot. And so I'm studying on ways we can implement interventions um, on a larger scale um, in my classroom. Very nice. Um, so I think I, Ben, I'll please say, you know, <laughs> Even though you introduced us, uh, if you have any research idea you want to share or say. Yes, uh, well, I, I'm uh, teaching at Georgia State University. It's uh, teaching math for the first two years. Uh, so basically, I'm teaching the upper level courses, pre-calculus, Calc 1 and 2. And uh, my thesis, my dissertation was on online learning because and I've been teaching online for over 20 years. So my research interest is online learning and uh, you know how students learn in the online environment and anything to do with online. So that is my interest. Got it, got it. Um, so here, uh, Trish can have some idea from Behnaz how to you know be uh, successful in online learning because right now the whole environment is about online. So here is the master 
you know, you can get something from her. Like, you know, hardly. one thing I... Hardly. <laughs> no, no. I think, uh, yeah, I think I learned a lot from you. At, um, uh, you gave a talk about online learning and then I asked, you know, a bunch of questions how to organize because it was first time for me to teach. And then you said, well, you got to organize. You have to have this um, questionnaire in the beginning of the uh, semester, like write your name, email. Did you read the syllabus? These questions you should give the student, and so the students are responsible and you know taking uh, education seriously. Okay, so a little bit about um, how I got interested. So it was a um, department meeting, and they had a. Um, this amatic conference, uh, so you have to pay the fee, but there is a lottery in the department meeting, and if your name comes, then you get free uh, fee to go to the amatic conference, and the university you know, college will also provide you the travel grant and things like that. So I, I just randomly, I mean, I went to this meeting, which is professional development meeting at the BMCC at in my college, and I got that chip, and my name was there, so I was like, okay, so. I'm going to go to Amatic, Milwaukee. That's where it's to start, 2019, Milwaukee. I went and I first thing I noticed that everyone is very happy. That's like a big change. When I go to math conference, everyone is like serious. And there's like, oh, my theorem is really important. It is powerful. But when I went to this Milwaukee conference, math education, it's like, everyone is so nice and they talk to each other and they care about each other. There is no theorem, there is no which theorem is important, which theorem is strong and things like that anyway. So I went to the conference, I attended the talks and then I got uh, interested in that. Uh, after that, I started uh, reading, uh, they uh, published something called Math Educator. Uh, that's a um, um, journal, which Amatic, American Mathematical Association of two-year colleges. They published that journal. So I read like 10 of them, 10 of them meaning 10 years, something like that. So I read a lot and then I was like, okay, I think I can do um, you know, something in math. And since then I started reading a lot and then I published, I don't know, 11 papers so far, just in one year. So here, what I want to tell you a little experience of 2019, I went to Milwaukee, met people, they're very happy. Then I was like, okay, I can do something here. And then I learned from Ematic, read the uh, journal and then got, got my own ideas writing that term. So one thing when you are starting, so here we are, first of all, the topic of today's talk is research on mathematics, teaching and learning at two-year colleges. So, um, it's not very common that we do research in math, but it's important to involve in that. Why is that? Because then we develop a skill, we learn new tools, how to teach or how to be a successful, you know, um, in math um, teaching or math learning. Because when we are in the classroom, sure we teach, but we also learn how students learn. That's a research. Anyway, so um, any questions so far? Okay, so let me a little bit answer uh, Trish. She had a, you know, how do I know that, how are my students doing or they're successful, correct? That, something like that you wanted to know? I think, um, well, this is like a broad question. So if you focus, you can maybe break this question down. How do I know my student learning X, Y, Z whatever X, Y, Z, maybe quadratic equation, maybe a line, maybe certain topic are the understanding. And then there is a way you can test that, like pre-test. And you teach the lesson, you do your assignment, da, 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 and then you do post-test, test, you know, and then you can see, is there a difference? Before you presented the lesson, you presented the lesson, and after you presented the lesson, what's the what's your data like what your data says about it is unclear just i'll show you a paper where um uh, clara she's talking about this concept inventory in uh, you know college algebra course and she invented this um, bunch of questions and she was you know taking the interviews and wants to see how the students are performing so i'll show you that paper Okay, Christine, what's what's your question? What, what or what's your uh, you know um, not a question like uh, your idea or thought or something or uh, research why, you know, interest? Why why you don't teach history of mathematics in two year colleges? 
Say it again. Why we don't teach history of mathematics in two-year college? Do you teach? In I work in Harper College. In so in my, sure. In my school, they do offer history of mathematics. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, okay. they do. And I think it's important because when you follow this uh, this trajectory, then you can see the development in mathematics. Like you know, Euclid this this da 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 nineteen hundred this happens two thousand we are here. You know, the quadratic equation we couldn't solve for thousand years. Then I don't know we developed this quadratic formula. So I, I, I guess I get the idea that yes, it is important to learn history of a subject, and then you can see the development uh, in that subject. Okay. Very nice. I was going to ask Christine if um, your research interest or something, if you have, because I feel like I shouldn't be talking much, but rather I will be listening. And if I can say something, that would be probably helpful. So I've been doing research the last couple of years on math anxiety and the causes uh -huh. of math anxiety have been really well studied. Um, but interventions, not quite so much, and specifically interventions for community college students, there is nothing out there. Well, there's a, there's a few little things. And so I'm looking at different ways of sort of utilize, utilizing educational psychology knowledge and techniques in the math classroom. Um, and I'm sort of zeroing in on writing interventions um, to help alleviate math anxiety. So I'm thinking about um, doing a mixed methods study of um, you know, measuring levels of math anxiety at the start of the quarter and at the end of the quarter, but also looking at the journal entries to see the qualitatively the difference in anxiety levels as we progress. So do you have any uh, results so far? No, no, I'm, I'm looking at implementing my study next year. I see, I see, very nice. Um, I see another person, Sarah Miller. Sarah, do you want to say something? About uh, what is one minus two? In India, we are uh, England, we call negative minus one. But here in USA, we call negative one. So what is the difference between minus and negative? Well, as far as I know, the words are different. One is minus, one is negative. <laughs> well, both are, um, no, I guess. Minus one uh, is wrong. Negative one is right. You know uh, why? You know why? Well, minus because it's additive five. inverse. It's minus, additive inverse of one. Minus is binary operation. Negative is unary operation. Uh, I don't think minus is, you know, uh, depends binary where operation. you're defining. It, it is binary on the set of integer, but not on the natural number. You okay. cannot have a negative operation from integer cross integer to integer because okay. Thank you. you leave the set. But it is a binary operation on the set of integers or real numbers, but not on the natural numbers. So let me define what a binary operation is. Binary operation, it's, an, it's a map from a set cross set to the set itself. But if the operation leaves the set, then you, you're not going to call it. It has a binary operation. Hence, the minus, which you're saying, it's, it's not a binary operation on a set of natural number. For an example, 1 minus 3, that's minus 2. That's not landing on the set of natural number. Is unclear, Krish? No, but uh, my, uh, binary means you need two inputs. Unary means only one input. Sure, binary means two input, but output has to be in the set. I know. But, the, but if you fix the set as, as a natural number, then it leaves the set. So it's not a binary operation. Okay? Yeah. Okay. But it is a binary operation on the set of integer. Okay. Is that making sense? Yeah, thank if, you. If you take, thank yeah. You. So you, you learn in the set of integer. Anyway, Sarah, I wanted to know a little bit um, your research interest. So I had investigated that I was trying to want to start my initiative trying to uh, find uh, who are undecided in their readers for art for STEM deals. But, um, um, uh, let me interrupt. You. Can you hear what is she saying, you guys? I'm not sure. If it... No, she's really distorted. It yeah. sounds really slow and low. It's it's kind of, it's really strange. I've never heard that. Okay. 
Okay, I'll just listen to say okay, what's up with my, uh, my audio. I'll just listen for today. Um, we, we'll come back to that, I'm sorry, but we really cannot hear you, what you're saying. Um, uh, okay, so uh, what I prepared for this talk, let me just go a little bit um, on that. So when I was thinking about to prepare this talk and I was like, okay, so if you want to, you know, begin to write a paper on the math, you know, the math teaching or something, then I thought I'll organize, you know, better, but it seems like there is no way I can say, oh, these are the following paths you can do, but some ideas are there. So like, can you see the, uh, um, let me uh, first share the screen. Okay. So I'm going to share the screen. Uh, Benaz, I think I need to be a host to share the screen or something. So before I share this screen, what's the idea of my talk? My idea is like to motivate you so that you, you know, think about uh, writing probably a research paper in a journal, um, you know, math education journal. So some idea like um, uh, where to begin or how do you think about uh, writing? Uh, did any of you wrote a research paper before? Maybe yeah, I have. Um, yeah, I've done a little bit of work. Uh, nice. Uh, about about what? Uh, Corepisites, actually. Um, uh, I looked at, at, at some of the policies in the state of Missouri. So, got it. So, okay. So, I haven't published eleven papers or anything like that. <laughs> that <that's laughs> Is that how many you you've had in the last couple of years? No, just one, only one year. This year only, I started writing. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, I'll take to that folder where I prepare this material. But uh, so idea is my research is mostly uh, came from the classroom teaching. So let's say if you, you know, you have some idea, yeah? And you want to um, teach, a, let's say a simple, si simple example of squaring, yeah? You want to teach students how to square an algebraic expression. So you go and you teach the student like, okay, well, X square means X times X, three square means three times three or five square means five times five. But when you give, give the student a simple, um, let me show you uh, uh, an article which I wrote, then you see it, there is a you know problem that um, a student, uh, you see this kind of a difficulty. So, So this is one of the paper I wrote, a visual way to teach how to find a square of an algebraic expression. An idea of this paper is very simple, is that if you give a student this problem and ask them you know, to simplify, or give the student this problem and ask them to simplify, just sim these, this whole paper is about these two questions, that's about it. So when you give this student you know, problem to simplify like that, okay, they get it because they think they can distribute the exponent here in this problem, that's what the student work is. Do, can you see this? Um, can you see this screen, guys? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So this whole paper I just wrote about just having this experience from the classroom and then writing about that. So wait a second, how did I organize my thought? The idea was here is the problem which I see in the classroom. Here is the analysis of a student, what, what uh, analysis of a student's work. And then how did I inter, so intervention or intervene? Like Christine is interested in math anxiety intervention. I'm interested in just particular, you know, uh, teaching them how to solve that particular problem, which is a squaring of an algebraic expression. And then how did I do that? And what was the result? That's all that paper is about. So same idea. You can, you know, if you have any uh, uh, 
topic you think um, you want to write about it. So one idea you can, from your experience, what is student, what, what is their problem? How did you analyze the problem? So you have to so, show a student work, things like that. And then how did you make sure that is now a student learned that topic? So that's one way to you know, write a, a paper in, in math research. Is that clear? And that, uh, that was published um, in the journal called Mathematics Teaching Research Journal, yeah. So let me share the screen a little bit and uh, talk about that and let move to some you know, other kind of um, how you um, write paper probably or do research. Okay, so, so idea was simple idea. You, know, you want to teach how to find the square of an algebraic expression. Here is the problem. Students had their, you know, they showed their work like that. Then here is simplify, you know, here is this another question. And the students showed their work like that. What did I do then? I, so where is my contribution is, okay, let me teach you square means, a square of empty boxes means a box times box, put a, whatever the value inside the box. So here, if you see the mistake in a student's understanding, probably they memorize that they can distribute the exponent in this problem. Sure, here it works, the exponent they can distribute. And here, you know, when they try to distribute the exponent too, they get the wrong answer and that's clear why they get the wrong answer. But there is only one idea behind that, which is squaring an algebraic expression. So how are you gonna teach that idea or how did I do that? Well, I taught the student, well, let's understand what is the meaning of x squared, that means x times x. So what's the meaning of anything is squared is anything times anything put in that, you know, anything, anything. So, and that's this paper about, and then I see that the students were really, you know, happy to, to understand that, that you can replace this box with any expression you want to know square of that expression, just put in that box, put, it, put in that box. And then that's, that's this paper is all about. Okay, any question here? Uh, so so simple be, idea, huh? Yeah, would you be willing to share that article with us? I think it is many times when faculty are um, having the thought of doing research, they think of those elaborate kind of research, those jargons that read in first, you uh -huh. can't make any head or tail out of it. And they say, well, that's not for me. But you know, I really love what you did and what you did. So, yeah, yeah. So very practical. It's to the point. And I think this is something that, you know, we can promote and get more faculty because faculty who have like 20, 30 years of experience in classroom, who better to do the research, right, than us. But I think we are scared. We we get scared of, you know, the way this, all these jargon that out. I love it, the way that you... That's very nice, Benaz. Thank you for your comment. So one thing, since I'm a new in this uh, uh, this subject, so I don't, I just follow my heart and I don't follow nonsense. Like 30 pages, you have to write education research. No, you just have to say your idea. Here is one idea. I want to teach you how to find the square of an algebraic expression. If student have trouble, this is what I did and that's how I did, that's it. So that paper I can show you and I can also share with you. It's in the journal. Here I can take you to the journal. If you go to mathematics, I, I will definitely share with that. Mathematics teaching. Do you want, to put, the, uh, do you want to put the link in? Uh, yeah. Right now I'm gonna get the link here okay. from here. That's why I, I'm going there, yeah. So this is the volume here. Volume, I mean, volume 13 and two summer 2021. And that's here, that paper is here. Uh, that paper, I so I wrote it and I'm gonna put this now, uh, copy that same paper and just a short paper four pages because yeah. i don't like uh you know i don't like uh, jargon as man <laughs> yeah this is awesome yeah. yeah yeah so um one thing that Benaz noticed is that it's easy to read because it's very short it's like you know a little storybook so you can one can organize uh, your thought in just like, okay, I want to teach how to factor quadratic equation. That's it. And then do exactly what you do in the class. What is the student's difficulty? Because that's what general wants to know. 
why is this important what you're writing? So what was a student's difficulty? And then how did you overcome that difficulty? That's it. You can finish, you can write, I don't know, 70 papers on just this topic. Take a topic, do this idea. What was the student's difficulty? How did you help that? Or how did you overcome that difficulty? And write that process. That's about it. That's one way to write. And that's how my writing is about. Let me see there if there is a, in the chat anything. Okay. Um, how do we remove perception that math is difficult? Um, well, so there is a, you know, uh, I don't know the English uh, sentence or the statement, but it's like why wisdom can't be told. It's, you really have to be, you know, I cannot like, you have to see wisdom by yourself. Is that making sense? So once I read this statement, I really like wisdom can't be told. So math, you know, um, I'm not sure what, let me just check it in the chat. How do we remove uh, perception? I have oh, oh, oh. Okay, so uh, well, um, I think students feel math is difficult because we instructor don't do a good job teaching, teaching the student. We teach as banners and jargon. We teach them, you know, A plus B whole square means A square plus B square plus two AB. That's a nonsense because we keep them in their brain that is space to memorize, memorize, memorize. And that's where they feel it's like, it's something not like I eating from fork and a spoon, which they can pick and just eat. But you can tease the same thing, A plus B. A square means what? A square means thing times things. Whatever, if you put A plus B, just put A plus B times A plus B. Now do your math, like foil and foil, whatever that is. So one way, I mean, how can you know this perception? So question asked in the chat, I'm just repeating, repeating the question. How do we remove perception that math is difficult? Okay, I saw a quadrigate by. That's all good, but um, that's all I can say. So when we are preparing our lecture or lesson plan, we have to, we have to understand where students are. What are their, you know, in their mind? What do you think they don't know? You, you have to go through that and how, and then you have to build a, a lesson on that. That's when you will feel connected with the students. Let me give an example. If you want to teach a Pythagorean theorem, please don't tell the student that Pythagorean theorem is, is means a, a squared plus b squared plus c is equal to c squared. First of all, that's wrong. Second of all, I mean wrong because the context is missing. And second of all, a theorem, a statement of theorem is not as powerful as the proof of the theorem. Clear? So uh, one paper I'm going to show you, I didn't write, but it's a very, very nicely written paper and I really liked it. That's one way you connect with the student, you um, present your lesson in a way that, that you know, uh, students, grasps it. It's like eating food with a fork. You don't need to teach after 10 years, you know, they are. So you have to do that. Um, I think uh, uh, that homework where the instructor has to pay a lot of attention to how they're teaching. So uh, I think I'm going to share another paper about uh, this. Before, what I said. You, do that, before yeah. you do that, Arathana, I have a question for you. This article that you shared with us, I do not see in it uh, review of the literature, it wasn't that required by this uh, institution when you submitted your article, your research. Article. Most of the time they want review of literature, they want some, you know. That's, that's the good part of the journal probably because they welcome your thoughts. I mean, if you want to do review, this is nonsense as you say, it's a jargon and no one wants to read. You don't want to read 20 page. I don't want to waste my time 20 page. I just want to say, here is the problem. This is what the problem is all about. And that's what I did about it. So when you go to this journal called Mathematics Teaching Research Journal, you will see what they're looking for. That's okay. another thing you have to notice when you're writing about a journal, you definitely have to read what is this journal is talking about. Is this journal talking about the classroom teaching or is this journal talking about the data? Like, okay, bunch of 600 students, you, uh, you know, you got the data and you want to say something about from this data. So this journal was very like, a, it says your classroom teaching experience. So that's why awesome. they did not ask anything. 
Awesome. Yeah. That is yeah. good. That is very good. And I think that's the other thing that we need to share with our faculty, the different journals that we have had experience with. And, you know, I love it. The, the, the article is to the point, short. I've never seen an article this easy to understand. I think we as classroom teachers, we have to promote that. You know, I, I sometimes uh, come to, um, you know, journals and I just put it aside. I don't have the patience to read that. You know, it, it just go to jargons just to fill it up. But give me something that I can use it in my classroom. And I love it, the way you tackle that. It, exactly, exactly. So um, I'm going to share, uh, thank you, Benas, for that comment. I really feel I'm happy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share another paper about this Pythagorean theorem, which I'm, um, I was talking about. And this um, author, Rodinov, he writes, how do you motivate a student? So uh, Chris, uh, Revoluri, you asked me, you know, uh, students feel um, math is very tough or some, something. That was your question in the chat. Let me show you how do you motivate students. A yeah. paper on that. It's like four four pages. And, and I think I want to say maybe out loud, you really have to like um, not just read the paper, but understand and just do in your classroom. So then you, you'll succeed in your classroom and the student will not say math is difficult. So let me uh, share that screen. Mm. So this is a paper, it's I mean, not that uh, big, uh, you know, eight pages, but probably I think the last two pages are the references or something like that. So it's like six pages, seven pages paper. You can read about it. It's about motivational orientation of the methodological um, system of teaching mathematics in secondary school. I mean, there is no big deal in teaching secondary school or you know, teaching is teaching. I mean, it's about understanding mathematics. So long story short, this uh, author says the structure of the method here. First, he says about the introduction, what they're talking about, the motivation and then the structure of mathematics system of teaching mathematics. Then he talks about a little bit the purpose of mathematics education. I think I like that, uh, that part and he, this diagram. Then here is the best part, which I liked it, how he introduces the Pythagorean theorem in 12th class math or some, whatever, a secondary school. He never teaches the kids or the student that, okay, Pythagorean theorem is about a square plus b square is equal to c square. I mean, first of all, that's wrong. The context is missing. It has to be a right triangle. Then he says, you know, how do you teach this topic? Actually, he asked the student to construct and from the similar triangle, they get this relationship. And then the student themselves, they develop that. So uh, once again, I will highly recommend you guys to read that paper. I don't know how to put that but maybe I'll, I'll try to get the link and put there. So um, let me come back to the Zoom here. So there the author doesn't just goes the picks the formula and just uh, puts on the blackboard. He does his homework. Why the Pythagorean theorem is true? And why, why the student, they have to just listen you A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Why, how do you, give that curiosity, like build that curiosity among the students. When you do that, then a student will never hate math. They will love math and they will not say it's difficult because they know how to prove it. I mean, they own it, you know? So that paper, uh, it's very, very mm -hmm. nicely written paper. And uh, I will highly recommend, please look at six pages, you know, um, so read that read, uh, that paper. So I think I'm going at the end of this meeting. I'll uh, take your emails or something, and I will send uh, those links. Okay, uh, that that way it will be a little more uh, efficient. A any question at this point? Well, I I kind of had this this uh, I don't know thought brewing in my head. I have multiple college algebra classes, and um, I have done a lot of quizzing over the years. And um, anyway, I, I guess what I was, one of the things I'm interested in or one of the things that's on my, 
my uh, on my mind is in my online classes because of the sheer number of students I have and because of different things what I've I've kind of moved to is this idea where they have to do it and then they have to they get the key they have to grade it and then the assignment is actually a reflection and I call that a reflective quiz but in my seated classes I still give plain old quizzes <laughs> you know um, the reflective quiz is just on a, in an online class, it gives them immediately, this is what, how you're supposed to, or what I was expecting from this question. Um, so then there, you know, I, I grade the, the reflections, but it's just not, it doesn't feel like I have to get it all done right this second, you know? Um, so I guess one of the things I've been kind of playing around in my mind is, is trying to nail down, um, is both ways, uh, which way is more helpful for the students? Are the, are the students who are, are getting the in-class, you know, typical quiz that they have to complete without any resources kind of quiz? Or is this kind of reflective way of quizzing um, a little bit, you know, what's more effective for student learning? So if I wanted to awesome. set something up like that and then write about it, I guess, <laughs> I'm so guessing um, I want like some help because okay so let's let first let's talk about why do you think the quiz is important in, in any ways both ways well um I've always used quizzing as a way to communicate to the students um what's important you know mm -hmm. um so they understand before the test what things are going to look like what I think is important um, so they get feedback before the test, like um, how I, you know, all that, all that, how do you grade? What do you expect? All that kind of stuff. I always feel like that they shouldn't see that for the first time on test one. You um, know, let's, let's go a little more, like not focus, let's look from little far. Why do okay. we do this testing exam? Why? Oh, well, I, I guess I'm hopefully um, I'm trying to accurately assess my student learning so that I can exactly. accurately give student a grade learning, at the end. <laughs> correct? Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. students learning, correct? That's that's the uh, idea of the quiz. One way you can um, you can write about it is your, so, so when I think about this kind of question, I think as a hypothesis, what do I want to, what is my hypothesis? What do I want to uh, talk about? You know, that's like a, a research hypothesis or um, whatever abstract. So you can say that I'm trying to compare these, I assess college algebra, whatever course, X, Y, Z, and I did these two ways. I assess the student and here is my uh, result. That's it. And you do, this is the college algebra 2017 fall, 30 students took the course. I did the quiz like that. And here is the, their learning outcome or whatever, you know, here's 2019. Uh, college of the same course, same, you know, 40 students, and here is their result. You, you just compare. Okay. Now, if you want to focus only on one course, then you can talk about the effectiveness. One is just compare, two things, easy, just compare what you got, you know, like uh, uh, from, from your quiz collection or the data collection from the quiz. And the second is you just focus on one course and effectiveness of your um, method of teaching that particular topic and quizzing on that. So, so when you try to get this data, you don't wanna be only focusing on one data set. You want to do this data, let's say it's called diagnostic test. So before you introduce the chapter, then you introduce the chapter and then you took the uh, again quiz. So this way you can compare a student, focus is not about a quiz, focus is about the student's learning, which everyone cares. So how are you mm -hmm. going to do that? Well, this is their understanding before I taught. This is how I taught. And now this is their understanding. Do, do you see what I'm talking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let me share another paper I wrote about it. And I'll show uh, um, how did I do that. Uh, is that okay, guys? Sure. Okay. So one of the, uh, before, okay, let me, before I share this, let me talk about that. So absolute value, you know, question is, solve for x and here is absolute value of x is equal to i don't know five 
very difficult. It looks bothering. Absolute value of x is equal to five. You have to solve for x. And the students are confused. What, like, what is going on here? Same problem, you can communicate to the students saying, hey, what are those numbers whose distance from the origin is five unit? Chris, what are those numbers? Can I have one, please? A distance is five from zero. What are the numbers? Anyone? Give me the answer. What are the numbers from whose distance from zero is five? What are those numbers? Oh, you're muted anyway. Five and five negative five, negative. exactly. So see that how simple it is when you say in this language, correct? So that is all this paper about. I took this idea, I put the number line, I put the boxes and the students are very like, not very, but I see huge progress. So I'm gonna share the paper and how did I, you know, approach that uh, student learning um, aspect. So let me go here. Um, Nope. Discoveries. Yeah. So uh, the topic I gave students difficulty with problem involving absolute value, how to tackle this using number line and box method. Anyway, the same introduction, the students have difficulty, da da, whatever they say here. So when you teach this uh, topic or idea here is that how the book teaches and their students get confused, they mix match and they have no clue why is that. Then I said, well, wait a second. Analysis of a student, what is their difficulty? When you give the student, they get, you know, they do this kind of, you see that there are a bunch of mistakes here, which I wrote. Then what did I do about it? Well, I developed a theory using the number line of the box method. And what is that? So basically, I am just teaching them what is the meaning of absolute value. That's about it. And it's to love it, see that? So this is my contribution in this whole paper, that's it. So absolute value of anything inside a box means, you know, that's, that's a meaning, you know, interpretation using number line and just as a, just using symbols. Now students are not confusing, not confused. Here is students work using number line box method and I show them, see that they are performing well. And that's this paper about, do you see that? That's it, that's, that's how I write paper, like six pages or four pages. So this is the part where you are, you probably you, I mean, you play a role. Like here is the student's difficulty. This is what I, my contribution is. And this is what the outcome is, that, that's all. That's all. Do you like guys this 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 picture? Very good. Yeah, I definitely like um, you know, notice that um, student really really don't get confused with this inequality and this inequality. My idea was like absolute value of something equals to me k. It means the number could be k and minus k because these two numbers are, you know, distance k apart. For, I mean, distance k from the origin. Anyway, and then I introduced this idea. So before this, I wrote this paper, I wrote another paper where I developed this absolute value theory. So I, I took the, this problem and then, you know, solve for X, da, da. then I said, okay, that's how one should teach, or this is one way to teach. This problem translates into finding all the numbers whose distance from the origin is five unit. That's how one needs to teach the student. Please don't teach them is symbols because they don't like it. And then we draw the number line and find the numbers whose distance from the origin is five unit. Okay, great. There's two numbers. We got the numbers and five and minus five. Okay, what about this one? Aha, this question translate same as this problem. But only thing if you can move this X as a some box, you know, some box. So let us replace this by a box. Now this problem translated this, and this is main principal problem. And now student can, you know, just put the box, whatever the value of box and write it down. Another problem like that. So I developed a theory and then I tested this in the another paper. And that's what my result is all about. Any question guys? Did you like that absolute value? That was my first paper ever I wrote. And I, I'm very happy about it. So the idea is like, okay, you know, here is that how I want to teach or maybe uh, Trish, this is how you 
teaching and you want to test how is your teaching so you can do the testing by collecting student work you know you don't have to exactly data or diagnostic test you can just like keep their keep their keep how, how they're doing in the assignment just like you know one problem just one problem on that topic and then you can write about it there are plenty of journals which will accept this kind of article and, and they're peer reviewed can you okay, tell us so other, are there other what, what other journals will accept an article like this one um so there are certain articles so let me just uh, pull up the um, list i made uh, maybe here So some, there is no ordering or anything like that, but these are the uh, journals. They will accept mathematics teaching research journal, the New Jersey mathematics teachers, mathematic education. This is a little bit tricky because they always want to look for a data set. Like you, ha you have to like, I don't know, 100 data set, then they will. Um, okay, for learning of mathematics, this is very prestigious journal for mathematics education. They are not, so much into data, but they are really so much into, as Behna said, like, okay, this was, you know, kind of a history and philosophy of mathematics. I will show you a paper on learning of mathematics from this journal. Mathematics enthusiasts, the college mathematics journal, these are all about, you know, uh, they're not that much data uh, focused except the mathematics educator. A journal for research mathematics is, you, is data. Ready from a list you could share with us? Oh, oh, wait, sorry, I was not sharing. Uh, Hold on. Okay. Okay, can you see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. So um I think except mathematic this mathematic educator, all the and, and the journal for research in mathematics. I think all of them are very, uh, they're, they're happy to, to you know, publish this kind of article which has less data points or a data set which is uh, smaller. Conference proceedings basically means you go to a, a conference and they have a journal attached to that conference and you can publish there. These are, this is just gen some ideas about the you know, math journals. Any, any other question, guys? Any other question? Okay, so what should I do next? I got, I want you guys to talk a little bit. So far so good. Okay, so let me share a little bit uh, the papers which I collected for uh, not that I liked or I didn't like, but rather, you know, these kind of papers, I think this, okay. So um, that's nice, Sarah, thank you. So let me go and share some papers which I collected and I want to talk a little bit about. Um, okay, so this is the paper I was, um, you know, talking about the um, how to motivate a student da, 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 and how this uh, author did the Pythagorean theorem not just telling what is a Pythagorean theorem, but rather asking a student to, to build that from the scratch. And the students were able to do that. And he, he how did he you know, achieve that goal? That is what in this paper, which I lied about it. Okay, um, let's see here, what's there? So this is another kind of paper you can write where you teach about certain kind of, you know, teaching strategies like inquiry-based teaching or active learning. And here the instructor says, you know, or the author, sorry, says that here uh, they use this kind of methodology and they're uh, using the card game. Uh, so let me go back here. Yeah, like they use this activity card and this is what all this paper, this paper is about. And, you know, you don't need to collect data, but here is the conversation between the student A and B and the instructor. So exactly what you're doing in the classroom, you did for this particular topic, and that was this paper is about. Do you see there is like no data needed here? Absolutely no, like, uh, oh, here is 20, 20 students were selected, nothing like that. 
Okay, so that's um, that's like uh, one way to write a paper about your classroom teaching. Okay, what else I have? Students difficulty, da -da, I did that. Mm. This, this paper is more about um, framework for students thinking around, around this particular topic, which is substitution equivalence. And here, let me get the points what I want to talk about here. Here, if you see that um, instructor, so here is like they have hypotheses and they want to test this hypothesis and how they're going to test, test meaning which kind of theory they're going to use to test the hypothesis and that and what was their result. So um, um, when you are when you are collecting data, you have to have a hypothesis. What are you trying to collect data on? What's your what's your hypothesis? That's number one. Number two, you know, some background history. I mean, what are you doing? I mean, did you read like more things related to that particular topic? Then you selected your data. What's your method? How are you going to use? Which method you're going to use to, you know, to get a qualitative or quantitative aspect from that data? That's, that's a method. Then what's your outcome? What did you, you know, learn from this data set? That's, that's another way to write a um, research paper. And that's what I was sharing. So let me share again. Um, so here uh, she is trying to get a you know, framework for students thinking and then a uh, little bit, you know, background, what is done, who's done what, da, 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 then theoretical lens, what is what has been done in that topic? A proposed model for student thinking. So here is the author's contribution. What is she doing here? I mean, okay. And then you go. You know, these are two kind of um, substitution equivalence. This is on the topic because she is trying to understand the substitution equivalence. Then here is a student's work, how they are performing, and justification, or whatever. And at the end, she will have you know. This is what their result is all about. Here we have presented an example, student thinking data. Okay, that's one way. Let's go to another paper. Mm. Same thing, same author wrote another paper, development of the elementary algebra concept inventory for college context. So basically she's trying to understand, uh, so let me uh, say in the word, in college algebra course, there is a disconnection between conceptual understanding and procedural fluency. So she is just want to under uh, study, like you know, uh, these are the these are the problems I uh, uh, create. I mean, I made or I wrote, and I want to test on that. So here are twenty two item multiple choice um, answer da da. She created and then she is testing. But there is the background history, which has been what has been done then conceptual understanding, what is the meaning of conceptual understanding, defining that. Again, you have to read a little bit, uh, how, what's the definition of concept, conceptual understanding from, from different perspective or from the different you know, authors who are, who are the masters in this field. Then he or she builds up her, uh, those, those problems, the 22 problems, but she is not showing all of the 22 problems anyway. Some of the short problems she is showing here. And then research literature, Later, she will do you know results and discussion. So how she collected sample size of twenty three student from the twenty three you know college algebra students. Da, da, da. Then she went. She revised this uh, questionnaire and then she gave to one hundred sixty student and maybe in next time she was six hundred student. And that's uh, that's her. I think her result was is here. If I notice at the end, that's what she got about you know um, pre test versus post test scores and. This is a idea she's using. Item response theory is the one which she is using the method to, to you know, analyze the data set. So long story short, what I'm, uh, I'm telling here is you have research hypotheses. You want to test something or you build up a, you know, a question, you know, a quiz test or something. Then you have to do, you know, on what basis you are, you, what method are you using to test uh, your hypothesis. You collected a data, 
you gave this, you know. So one simple way to do um, uh, this, this thing is called pre-test and post-test analysis. So if you want to uh, like understand certain concept or idea among the students, you want to do a pre-test before you introduce the concept and idea, you introduce the concept and idea, and you want to do a uh, post test, then you can see just as a number how many were not able to understand and how many got, you know, after you introduced the idea, how many understood the, whatever you were teaching. So that's pre test, post test analysis. But there are a bunch of many different ways to uh, analyze a data set. So I was showing that, you know, another way to uh, write a research paper. Anyway, any other question here? So far, so good. Have okay. Two more minutes. <laughs> um, I think oh, only one more minute. So, um, th a last thing I want to share a screen which I really, really like, liked when I teach a course and I think about uh, you know a lesson plan, and then I will stop. Okay. So, long story short, I'm saying that they now having a big data set or a small data set is not that important. The important is your idea. What are what you're trying to convey? That's that's the important part here. Okay, so let me post this picture. Did ever anyone saw that that picture before? It's a, from a story. It's called "Fish Is Fish." Let me pose another one. Same. Okay, let me go. I think it's a different one. So see that there is a frog, there is a fish, and there is a cow with you know some shape. Anyway, so that um, uh, I got it from this book, How Students Learn History, Math and Science from NCTM. So, and why do I bring that up? Um, let me go to that page particularly, history data. Here, that's, that's what the, it's a really, really a, a time when like my thought about teaching is changed or something fish history or something. Anyway, so I think I'm gonna keep that page or whatever. Let me go back to here, zoom. So fish is a fish. So what happens, there is a fish and there is a, a fish's friend called frog. So what happens, the frog goes outside the world and comes back inside the pond and the fish asks, hey, so frog says, wait, wait a second, do you know what? I saw another kind of creature, it's called a bird. So fishes imagines, oh, bird is like a fish with a feather, but, or wings, sorry, whatever. And then the frog said, wait a second, do you know what? I saw another kind of creature. So fish uh, says, uh, asks, what is that? So then the frog says, oh, I saw, you know, a cow. Now in fish's brain, fish thinks, oh, it's a, you know, animal with had a four uh, leg and it's like a fish, but it has a four leg. Then uh, frog says, wait a second, I saw another kind of creature outside the world. And then fish is, what is that? So it's like a, a human, which has a two, you know, leg. So fish thinks, oh, it's a fish, which has only two legs. So long story short from here, what the author says, what, or what I learned is, when you are teaching a student, you have to understand what is, what does a student know? From there, you have to build, build their, uh, you know, knowledge or idea. Is that making sense? So in this fish story, fish always thinking is everything, everything is like a fish, but with a feather or with a two leg or with a four leg, because that's in her idea, everything is like a fish. So when you're going in a classroom, you have to, you know, go to that level that you need to know what your student know or what they don't know, or more importantly, more importantly, what they know, which is wrong. And then you build the theory on that. Then when you do all these uh, little things, then I think um, a student will love math and they will love you too. <laughs> they will love all math teachers. I really like this fish is a fish story. Very, very nice. Okay, I think I'm going to stop and that's about awesome. it. Awesome, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I learned a lot, so I'm sure uh, others too. Uh, so hopefully we all can embark on this uh, path of research and get something going. Yeah, yeah, and you always, uh, I mean, email me or if you want to talk some ideas. I mean, I'm not expert. I just started, you know, I'm a fish still. 
thinking man with a fist with two legs. So, but I can, you know, say or ask other faculty or wherever I can help, I'm happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, it was very nice. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Awesome. Any question, guys? Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye.